Thank you so much, and thank you for the generous introduction. And uh, we are certainly going to have time for questions and answers, which I, I find uh, always the, the most exciting and stimulating part of any presentation or any opportunity to speak with people. And if people want to ask me about the Clintons in law school, uh, you are free to. You can even ask me whether or not he inhaled. And uh, we, can, we can deal with that or anything else that, uh, that comes to mind. Uh, your your in introduction raised some of the basic reasons that I, I wrote this book. I, I had a book a year ago, uh, and I spoke here at Heritage about it, called The Ten Big Lies About America, which focused on some of the, the core misconceptions and misrepresentations that anti-Americans use to smear this country very regularly. The most common, of course, being that America was founded on genocide against Native Americans, uh, or that America built its wealth entirely through the crime of slavery. And I take these lies and I rebut them one by one, and, and the book facilitated a great deal of discussion and conversation. It was 12 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. And uh, I, I was very struck, however, that the, the one of the 10 big lies that was most controversial of all was the big lie that says that uh, the growth of corporations has harmed the American experience and damaged the American people. I mean, it clearly hasn't. It's, it should be fairly obvious to everybody that it hasn't. Uh, those of you who came here uh, on some means other than walking, uh, benefited from some corporation that created the bus or the car or the motor scooter, whatever it was that you came here with. And those of you who walked also benefited from shoes that were made somewhere. I mean, the, the involvement of business in our lives, every aspect of our lives in benefiting us, is so obvious and so ubiquitous and so omnipresent that it seems utterly bizarre that anyone could deny this. But I became very involved in promoting my, my previous book from last year with some of these totally uh, widely accepted and unthinkingly accepted lies about American business that I determined that uh, a, an entire book, especially in the midst of the economic downturn, dealing with some of those lies uh, was needed and appropriate. And, and to focus this for just a moment on how some of these lies operate and how they are contradicted by everyday reality, let me just share for you a little contrast that, that has emerged as part of this book tour so far. I, um, this is the third stop on my book tour. Actually, I, I want to be honest, it's the fourth stop. I was in Philadelphia yesterday and uh, San Francisco the day before, and then uh, last week I was in New York City. And during the time I was in New York City, I had an interesting experience. I, I had very close connections with uh, air transport. And um, I, I had the experience of flying to New York from Seattle, which is where I live, and found that uh, as generally happens when I rely on our air transportation system, it performs. I mean, I know that people do a lot of complaining about airlines in America, and they are imperfect, and yes, they're heavily regulated, and yes, they sometimes lose luggage, and they sometimes keep you on the tarmac for five hours, but it's rare. Generally, if you're getting on an airplane and they tell you they're going to have you somewhere, they've also adjusted schedules, you may have noticed that, to make them more realistic, so that, that actually the percentage of on-time arrivals has been going up. Basically, our airline system works, and it worked for me in flying to New York. My planes, both going to and coming from New York City, arrived early, which means I must have been doing something right. It was wonderful. The problem was I did my radio show from our studios. We have studios in the Empire State Building. And then the day after I arrived, having arrived nicely, not just on time, but early, I then had to rely on the highway system and uh, actually was being taken out to a book signing on Long Island. And there, the traffic was appalling, uh, bumper to bumper. It was deeply frustrating, deeply annoying, and we arrived late. Okay, two different alternatives in transportation. Airlines, highway system. 
What's the key difference? Highways represent the ultimate in a government monopoly. Okay, airlines, you can say, well, it's not so much wild free enterprise, it is heavily regulated. Yes, but the airline companies are in it for a profit. And being in it for a profit, you have to do something to actually please the public. You can go out of business. There are airlines that have gone out of business. Anyone heard from TWA recently? Or Pan Am? Or Braniff? Those were big companies. They all went away. If an airline doesn't function, if an airline functioned like the road system in New York City and environs, it would go out of business. If airlines functioned like any of the new mass transit systems that they've built in big cities across the country, which I highlight in my book, they would go out of business and they'd be out of business tomorrow. I, I basically, I do some basic math in the book about the new light rail system that was opened with much fanfare in 2009 in, in Seattle where I live. And based upon the figures that they've announced, which are probably understated, that 14-mile light rail system has cost over $100,000 per yard, per yard to build. Just calculating the interest on the capital expenditures on this idiotic central link that no one is riding, just calculating the interest, right, on the capital expenditures, not the capital expenditures themselves, not the principal, in terms of the interest alone, every single rider is being subsidized every time he steps on that train to the tune of $140. Okay, it would be cheaper to buy people cabs. Really, it's much cheaper. Think of how much government money you could save, and it's federal, state, and local, to build this nothing. Seriously, if, if you to travel 14 miles, you have to travel 14 miles, and most of these trips are not the full length of the light rail, it's just a few miles. You could offer people, okay, take the $140, and you can not only have a cab, you can have a lunch inside the cab that you're taking and save the taxpayer half the money that they're paying just on the interest, not even the capital expenditure, on building this white elephant. The difference between business and government is basically capsulized by a, a quote from Milton Friedman that... Uh, represents the very spiritual core of my book, which is that people spend their own money more carefully than they spend other people's money. What a concept. What a concept. Now, of course, the lies about American business would have you believe that that concept and that the realities of a for-profit system are somehow evil and suspect and destructive and greedy. Let me go through the five big lies very quickly and then open it up for your questions and, and try to give you some indication why I think each of these lies is directly relevant uh, and, and very, very important for debates that are going on right now and why it is that the five big lies about American business makes a totally necessary Christmas present uh, for any uh, American who wants to be informed or aware or optimistic at all about this country. Okay, big lie number one is the big lie that says that capitalism is doomed as indicated by uh, our current financial downturn. And what's interesting is just in the time since I, I wrote th this book, which was earlier this year, and this moment, you're beginning to hear a little bit less about the, the doom of capitalism and the end of capitalism. I mean, Michael Moore's new movie, Capitalism, A Love Story, uh, Michael Moore announced on The Larry King Show, uh, where, of course, the, the most serious intellectual notions are advanced and promulgated in America every single night. <laughs> Michael Moore announced on The Larry King Show that, yeah, capitalism is over. Uh, this economic downturn shows it doesn't work. Does anyone remember? They want you to forget it. Newsweek ran a cover story a cover story that said, we are all socialists now. Do you remember that? It was only a few weeks ago, really. And then Newsweek came back. John Meacham, who's been a guest on my radio show several times, senior editor at Newsweek, he actually came back with a commentary. They run this cover that says, we are all socialists now. And then he was railing at conservatives for suggesting that Obama is a crypto socialist. Well, excuse me, if you're gonna run a cover of your magazine, we're all socialists now. Look, the, the idea that capitalism is doomed, I tell the story in, um, in the book about a school in Berkeley, California, that uh, actually every year they would have some gift 
from the graduating eighth grade class. It was an elementary school, private, exclusive, very progressive elementary school.